Amen. And welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. It is good to see all of you here today. Uh, I hope that all of you are glad to be here today. Is there an amen on that? Amen. 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 And so um, uh, we continue our journey this week with uh, John the Baptist and And so that's why we listen to Baptized in Water. And I invite you all to remember that you are baptized and to uh, remember that God has named and claimed you through your baptism. And uh, Joanne is not joining us today. She is in Richmond. Our granddaughter, Joanna, is in a Christmas pageant that's part of the worship service at the church that they're in. So uh, it is that time of year. <laughs> and and uh, when you have only one grandchild, she gets all the attention. So. So. Well, when you have four, you got to go four different times. <laughs> then it gets very busy. So anyway, I invite you to join me now in our call to worship in your bulletin. A voice is crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make a straight path through the desert. Lift up every valley. Bring down every mountain and hill. Make valley When we pass through the water, God will be with us. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And if you will continue to join me in unison with our opening prayer. O oh Lord, you know the deserts and the parched places in our lives. We seek your healing power. Lead us on this Advent journey to the place of new birth and to the place of our redemption. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading Matthew 3, verses 4 through 6. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So at this time, I invite the Isaac family to come up and light our Advent candle. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. From Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1 through 2. And I have a moment of silence. Be rejoiced, because the Lord's messenger is coming. He calls us into the water as a sign that we are changing our hearts and lives. On the third Sunday of Advent, be light the candle of joy. We hear the words of John the Baptist, whom God sent to prepare the way, and we know that our Savior is near. The sun of righteousness is rising. We enter the baptismal waters with gladness, knowing that our sins are washed away. We turn to Christ with anticipation and delight. We seek to be a people prepared for the Lord.
I wasn't able to find my camel hair coat this morning. <laughs> but I doubt that my words can have the same impact as those of John the Baptist of 2,000 years ago. A second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. I'll be reading Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Triconitus and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come to you in these quiet moments, in these, this time that we have set aside to worship and glorify your name. And we pray today that the words that are heard here today will be your words and your words alone. We ask this in your name. Amen. So this past Friday, uh, Joanne and I drove up to a funeral home in Madison County. We, we attended the funeral for the husband of one of Joanne's cousin. Her cousin had passed away several years ago. Liebert succumbed to cancer that he had been battling for a number of months. Family members came up during the funeral to offer their eulogy over Liebert. And as we all sat there, we began to hear this story of incredible generosity. Liebert was always there to help anyone who reached out for help. He was always there to notice when someone needed help that they wouldn't admit on their own. Now, except for his Mustang, which he had owned for many years, all of his other vehicles were always available to be loaned out to anyone who might request them. At random times, he would ask someone if they needed money as he was taking his wallet out of his pocket. And it wasn't as if he had a lot of money himself. He just perceived of someone's need and offered what he could. The Advent season is that season in our Christian calendar when we're called to special action to show compassion for others. As our journey today intersects with John the Baptist, I believe that we'll see in his ministry an action-oriented life of faith, a life of compassion and generosity, both in John and in those that he called himself. John was one who talked the talk, but he also walked the walk. Now, I'll admit at times, John seems a little rough around the edges by today's standards. 
uh, it might have been kind of difficult for those listening to John to see compassion in a man who had just called them brood of vipers. I wonder how well that will go over here one morning. Might not be a need for me to show up the next Sunday. (laughs) But sometimes we need those harsh words to wake us up. Within those harsh words, John held a true concern for those who, who came out from the cities and came out into the wilderness around the Jordan to hear him preach. A concern that they be prepared for what could come at any time. Now, in his book that we have been using, Adam Hamilton suggested it was most likely that John grew up in an area called Qumran, in the Jewish community of Essenes. The Essenes were ascetics who practiced the simple way of life. They they, uh, uh, gave up anything that they didn't need. They probably would uh, be described as homeless people today. They had a strict adherence to Jewish laws and ritual bathing. And they separated themselves from the rest of the community. The Essenes believed in the coming of the Messiah, and they saw themselves as the one that would prepare the way for this Messiah through their humble lifestyle. Sounds kind of like John the Baptist, doesn't it? He led a simple lifestyle in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. In other words, living off the land without any luxuries at all. John is the the forerunner, the, the messenger, the one who cries out in the wilderness to announce the need to repent of our sins. In what wilderness should our voices be crying out today? Did you find some interest in the beginning of chapter 3 where where Luke gives us all this detail of what's going on uh, in the world when when, uh, John the Baptist showed up? I I wonder how comfortable we might be if this morning we could transform somehow Luke's gospel into something a little more contemporary for us. Maybe bringing Luke's gospel closer to home like North Garden. So let's do a little wordsmithing. In the second year of the administration of President Joe Biden, when Glenn Youngkin was the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, during the time that Bishop Sharma Lewis served the Virginia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, the word of the Lord came to you all of you sitting here today. And you went out into the communities of Red Hill and North Garden and even beyond, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness for sins. Is that a little too real for you? It is more comfortable to simply read Luke's gospel version, isn't it? To allow ourselves to continue setting in the 21st century and read it as something that happened long ago and far away as if we were watching a Star Wars movie. We don't want Advent to be too close. Not up and personal like that. And, of course, we can always comfort ourselves with the thoughts that things were so very different in the first century. Or were they? There was politics in the first century. There were religious entities with religious leaders and religious infrastructures. John the Baptist singled out the two most despised groups in our text for today, the tax collectors who always had their hands in somebody's pockets. 
And the Roman soldiers who were always on someone's back. Maybe the first century wasn't all that different after all. Maybe rough, old, ragged John the Baptist was needed because it was a pre-Christian era. Pre-Christian. They were still untouched by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think that's it. That was the big difference, right? They worshipped pagan gods. They they were built around the political powers of the rich who lived very different standards than the common folk and were proud of it and always reminded everyone. So the old world, the world of John the Baptist, is pre-Christian, right? Okay, maybe you'll agree with me. What if we suggest, or if I suggest, that we're still living in a pre-Christian world? We can't say that we're in a post-Christian world because post-anything implies that something has become an integral part of the culture. It has become so ingrained in society's makeup that it's simply who we are. Can we look at each other eye to eye and claim our culture is post-Christian? Did we ever make it Christian in the first place? Let me offer this suggestion. Christians are post-resurrection people living in a pre-Christian world. Does that sound okay? Think about this. How can we look at the gangs of youth that exist on violence and despair and claim that we are post-Christian? How can we look at the greed of corporate executives and claim that we are post-Christian? How can we read the offensive and exclusionary language in our own discipline concerning the LGBTQ community and claim that we are post-Christian? How can we listen to the lies and deception coming out of the disaffiliation process of the United Methodist Church and claim that we are post-Christian? Christian. The truth is that just like John the Baptist, we live in a pre-Christian world. But there's good news that goes with that because it sets us free to continue with the ministry of John the Baptist today. The message remains the same even after 21 centuries. Prepare the way for the Lord. But before you embark for the wilderness, <laughs> have we prepared ourselves? Have we prepared ourselves to be a place of Christian love and sacrifice? Have we prepared ourselves by reviewing once again Jesus' final command to love one another? as I have loved you. Jesus loved us all the way to the cross. These are the things that we are called to consider in the season of Advent. So for this Advent, uh, here's an exercise. Ask yourself these questions. Are you willing to stand out in a crowd in the way John the Baptist was? Are you willing to ruffle some feathers in the way that John the Baptist did? Are you willing to speak out against customs that are contrary to God's love, as was John the Baptist? Are you willing to look odd or foolish for the sake of the gospel, as John the Baptist did? 
Are you just as willing to live a life in God's way as John the Baptist? Now, no one's asking you to find a stinky old camel's hair robe to wear or to eat locusts and wild honey, but you're certainly welcome to do all those things. You would certainly stand out. This morning, uh, the Isaacs lit the joy candle on our Advent wreath. As post-resurrection people, we have a message of joy to share with the world. The joy that God will send God's own son to die on the cross for all of us, for the gift of salvation and eternal life. In the gift-buying frenzy that's taking place right now in the world, God's gift to us is freely given, but it was bought and paid for at a great price. Be like John the Baptist this Advent. Share the joy of God's compassion and generosity in whatever way you feel God has called you to do so. And to God be the glory. Amen. I don't want to leave. <laughs> we don't want you to leave. <laughs> but there are some good folks waiting down the hill for me. They were probably wondering, what are we going to do with John the Baptist today? <clears throat> I invite you to spend your afternoon considering that yourself. I leave you in peace. Let us pray. Thank you for bringing us back together for another Sunday morning worship. Thanks for Pastor Tim. It's a busy time of the year for him and Joanne as they prepare the Bible studies and the many Christmas programs at each of the churches. Keep them safe in their travels. We thank you for sending our Savior as a babe in a manger. We thank you for John the Baptist preparing a way for Jesus. Thank you for our youth, Lord, for keeping them safe through another week. Please, we ask you continue to wrap your loving arms around them, guide them through life. Be with them as they prepare the Christmas program here at Mount Olivet. Thanks for the, being with those who have lost their loved ones, and we give thanks for the healing of the sick. We pray as we go through this season of Advent, we continue to learn the true meaning of Christmas and not let the business of the world take over. We give thanks for the progress that has taken place in the makeover in the social hall of our church. We anxiously wait for the completion so we can get back to doing social things that we do. Thank you for loving us more than anybody else. Use the offering we receive to better your church. Amen. If you'll rise for the benediction, please. May this Christmas bring love to your heart, health to your body, peace and joy to your home throughout the year. Amen. John the Baptist.